Welcome everyone to the third segment in our series of Sound Mind. In this series, we talk about healthy, normal brain aging and also about neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I am the host of this series, Dolores Gallagher Thompson. I'm a psychologist and research professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. And we are very fortunate to be joined by our special guest in this episode, and that is Miss Beatty Wolf. Beatty is uh, hailing from London, England, and she is a singer, songwriter, and has been hailed as a 20th century artist with a truly classic sound. Beatty is known at, Beatty is known for being at the forefront of pioneering new tangible formats for music. She's been described in many different ways as extraordinary by Forbes magazine, as ingenious by the Huntington Post, and as captivating by Wired magazine. So Beatty's career has taken her from being the artist who created the world's first 3D interactive album app for her debut album titled Eight, to being the co-developer of a research program that's going to look more closely at the power of music on persons with dementia. So, BD, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I think you've done the best intro imaginable, uh, Dolores. So, um, for me, you know, I grew up being totally sort of obsessed with storytelling. And um, as a kid, storytelling was the medium um, by which I did all my communications. And I guess there was a aha moment for me when I discovered that I could put stories to music and suddenly those stories could touch mm -hmm. more people and they could reach more people. Um, so I, I think I was about eight when I wrote, wrote my first song. Um, and then I decided really then and there I wanted to be a songwriter and so I realized I kind of had to be a singer to be mm -hmm. a songwriter. Mm -hmm. um, and around the same sort of time, I remember discovering my parents' record collection and seeing these records mm -hmm. and thinking, oh my God, this is it's like musical books, mm -hmm. you know, being able to open up these vinyls and read the liner notes and, you know, look at the artwork and really immerse mm -hmm. myself in the world of the artist. Mm -hmm. um, and there was something really beautiful and very tangible about that. Um, so fast forward, you know, a good number of years and it's time mm -hmm. for my first album release for eight, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. Um, and it's a very different era. You know, everything is now mm -hmm. digitalized. People are streaming music. It's, it's kind of a, a different climate to the one that I'd grown up in. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing wrong with that but I wanted to almost use technology as a way of preserving you know, the tangibility, the storytelling, and the ceremony that I'd experienced as a mm. kid, mm -hmm. but making it relevant for the modern generation. Mm. Um, that sounds like a tall order. <laughs> yeah. you know, you're trying to bring together the past and the present and the future because you have some very innovative ideas that aren't even really um, being applied yet but we know that you have them. So I think this is amazing what you're trying to do. So how did you get interested though in applying music and this musical background and talent that you have to the field of dementia? It seems like a very uh, difficult topic for an artist to deal with. Well, it's definitely unusual. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unconventional for a, a singer-songwriter to be in that space. Um, but I guess, it really came from also having these three core motivations. Mm -hmm. um, and the first was being of service in some capacity. The second is the power of one's intention. Mm -hmm. And the third is keeping the parameters open to whatever inspired me. Mm -hmm. So those three things have always sort of governed my life and influenced every decision that I've made. Um, so I remember discovering Oliver Sacks mm -hmm. for the first time and reading Music Ophelia mm -hmm. and reading these wonderful mm -hmm. case studies, yeah. looking at how music can help with such a range of ailments from mm -hmm. Parkinson's through to autism through to Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And I was so deeply moved by the work that he was doing. Um, 
and the and the warmth with which he was talking about the people that he was mm -hmm. working with mm -hmm. um, and I never while I was reading the book did I think oh I'm gonna go off and do something in this area but then I found out that my grandmother had been mm -hmm. diagnosed with dementia and she was living over in San Diego mm -hmm. uh, I was in London and I thought okay well whenever I'm doing regular shows in the States I'll make mm -hmm. a beeline mm -hmm. for her and I'll go and, and sing to her um, and I would arrive and she'd be you know very confused very disorientated wouldn't know who I was and after one or two songs it was like a light bulb mm -hmm. went on and she was you know asking me questions about lyrics saying that I must have sworn in a song because <laughs> she swore around me when I was a kid and mm -hmm. and she was totally present mm -hmm. and totally back to you know the, mm -hmm. the the lady that I knew mm -hmm. um, and then I would leave and I would get emails from the carers saying you know she'd been so much better after the music mm -hmm. so this sort of you know I guess began the seed of an idea mm -hmm. um, in my head yeah absolutely so you were inspired by Oliver Sacks but then it sounds like you've taken it further than what he what he did so could you describe that at all? Describe your process a little bit. Absolutely. So with Oliver Sacks, as I'm sure um, you know, he typically used familiar music. So he, mm -hmm. he used music that was ingrained in that psyche, in that subconscious. So the song that you know was, meant the most to you, the song you got married to, perhaps. Yeah. And he mm -hmm. would use that as a sort of trigger to bring mm -hmm. you back into the room, to reanimate, to connect. Mm -hmm. um, now, where I ended up going after this experience with my grandmother um, was actually into the music, uh, into the new music cat category. So music mm. that had no prior connection to the individuals who mm -hmm. were listening to it. Mm. Um, and this sort of came about because I was over in Portugal and a uh, mm. loved one with dementia was in a, a care home in, in the north of Porto. Um, and I decided to go and perform to him mm -hmm. and what was meant to be just for him ended up being for the whole ward of uh -huh. 150 residents mm -hmm. and none of them had heard my music and actually none of them spoke English they were all Portuguese mm. so there was no famili familiarity in the sense mm -hmm. of, of the music but there was also no lyrical link yes. um, mm -hmm. and what I was anticipating was mm -hmm. perhaps you know, a nice environment at best. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the performance, you know, where there had been mm -hmm. lots of clapping, lots of singing along, the manager of the care home said in his 10 years of being a director there, it was the best he'd ever seen mm. the group. Well, that's very impressive. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> so uh, so you're, you're, um, you've developed new music. Is that, am I understanding this correctly? So you're not taking music that they're already familiar with, as has been done in some studies and in some care homes in the United States as well, uh, where people have developed playlists of familiar music and given the individuals an iPod or something like that so that they could listen to it. But it sounds like you're describing something very different. This is new music, so do, and, and it has lyrics to it. Yes, uh -huh. in English, and with a Portuguese residents in a care home, even though they didn't understand the words and they'd never heard the music before, you had a positive response? A very positive response, uh -huh. very, very positive. What do you think might be responsible for that? Do you have any thoughts about what it is about this new music and the way that you put it together the way that you present it to people. What is it, do you think, that draws them out and enables them to be present with you? Oh, impossible. I mean, really impossible to answer. Um, and in many respects, you know, what that experience in Portugal did, you know, it led to this pilot study that we undertook. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And it almost, you know, it, it really brings up a lot more questions than it actually mm -hmm. answers. But I guess going back to Oliver Sacks, you know, he mm -hmm. ends musicophilia with the line, uh, music is a necessity for mm -hmm. those with dementia mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be familiar to exert yes. its emotional pull. Yes. Now he hadn't tested that non-familiar route, mm -hmm. but he was aware of it and mm -hmm. he was aware that it should be as effective. So I guess I've just 
in some ways gone down that track, mm -hmm. um, you know, from my particular experience. Well, it's possible that the, the new music stimulates some of the neuroplasticity of the brain, you know, that it allows some of the neurons that are still alive to actually fire and function and create new connections. Uh, it would be very interesting to study this in more detail. So I know, I understand that you're working with a foundation in the UK that is actually looking at some of the science behind the music. So can you tell us a little bit about this foundation and what their goals are? Sure. I mean, so it's a, it's a new foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and after the, you know, the experience in Portugal, I was really convinced that I wanted to take this further. Mm -hmm. um, so I teamed up with uh, the former marketing director of HSBC Bank um, mm -hmm. with a research company called 2020 Research mm -hmm. um, and with the Priory Care Group in the UK. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we conducted a research tour which ran for four months. Um, and I would go into a care home, perform a set of new music mm -hmm. um, for 30 minutes and the residents were monitored during the live performance, mm -hmm. but then also in the weeks following as they listened to the same mm -hmm. songs on headsets. Mm -hmm. So it was a combination of live and then playlists, but of the same tracks. Uh -huh. um, and what we saw was a 72% improvement in memory, communication across that four month period. Mm -hmm. um, we had people who were virtually catatonic, getting up and dancing. Uh -huh. um, we had individuals who hadn't spoken in almost a year singing along to these songs that they'd never heard. Mm -hmm. So there were these remarkable transformations. Yes, well, this sounds like it would be wonderful to actually see yes, in action. Yes, I agree. <laughs> and uh, good, well, I believe that we have a video clip that will show us some of your work that you've been describing. Fantastic. grow up, know that I'll make my own mistakes. And if I slip up, please be the rock that doesn't shake. Don't you know we need somebody, just somebody to take our hand? need somebody somebody who will understand and when i grow old please stay by me as i fade and if i grow cold please be the flame that holds the faith don't you know we need somebody just somebody to take our hand don't you know we need somebody somebody who will understand darling oh if i stray from the one that you love can't speak know that i'll love you till the end don't you know that you're somebody my somebody who understands don't you know that you're somebody somebody now until the end darling no
astray from the one that you love darling no i won't drift too far from your arms darling you bring me back to myself to myself darling you're that someone who will make me live on darling you're my someone who will make live on Well, this was very moving to see and very impactful on the people involved. You could, it was so clear, you know, from way, when it started to how it progressed and as they became more involved with what you were singing. It was very beautiful to watch. So I imagine then that this pilot study was very encouraging to you and that you want to take it further. So could you help us understand what the next steps are that you have planned? What are, what are you thinking is going to happen now? What would you like to have happen? I, I would like to take that study, um, that pilot study, that gives you know, a very positive indication in the right direction. Um, and I would like to turn it into a world-class study mm -hmm. that can sit on you know, any policymaker or lawyer or accountant's desk mm -hmm. and prove or go so you know go as far as you can mm -hmm. to prove that music is a necessity mm -hmm. for those with dementia mm -hmm. um, that would be success for me mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a very important goal and I have a feeling that you will reach it because you you are a person who sets your goals high and achieves them from what I can see but uh, I know that you've been invited to present your work at a major conference that Stanford University is hosting. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you plan to talk about and present at the conference. Sure. So I'll be talking probably in a lot more detail um, just about you know, the journey that has been the last year and a half, two years with this project um, mm -hmm. and all of the learnings and really going into more detail about what we're doing next. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. also something that I've noticed is, you know, there is so much potential in the tech world to do something major mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. space, mm -hmm. but they are waiting for the key that mm -hmm. is that research document mm -hmm. to allow them to do so. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I feel mm -hmm. like this research is, is so integral and it's so needed and it's mm -hmm. gonna provide that sort of vital piece of the puzzle that's been missing. Um, but I'm also going to be performing um, tomorrow and on a sort of entirely different subject, um, I have a, a music video that I thought we could uh, watch. Mm. All right, <laughs> that, sure. That we has a different story of its own. All right, well, that sounds good. Uh, be very interested to see it so great thank you Sh shall Can i we... give a brief intro oh yeah why yeah. don't you do that so that our audience knows what they're looking at okay yes. Go ahead. um so what you'll be seeing is um a live recording mm -hmm. that we did in the former home and kind of secret studio of mccartney ringo hendrix <laughs> lennon and yoko um this place called montague square um, mm -hmm. in London, which, mm -hmm. as you know, is the name of my latest album. Mm -hmm. um, and we recorded the album single, Take Me Home, in this wonderfully historic room where McCartney wrote Eleanor Rigby, mm -hmm. where Hendrix wrote The Wind Cries Mary, mm -hmm. where Yoko and Lennon first famously got naked. Mm -hmm. And um, that live recording was then translated uh, by this fabric designer into a silk fabric that reflected its geometric patterning. Mm -hmm. And that silk was then cut mm -hmm. into a musical jacket by the tailor who dressed Bowie, Hendrix, and Jagger in oh the 1960s. My. Oh my. <laughs> and this is a, oh, a total one-off, um, <laughs> one of one, um, another sort of world's first. We also decided to put NFC, near-field communication chips, in the jacket so you can tap 
the jacket with your phone to hear the music that's woven into it. Um, but Are you serious? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I could buy a jacket with this musical chip implanted with your music. Well, there's only one, Dolores. The, oh, there's only one. <laughs> oh, you I can, can't buy it You yet. can see okay. it in the v and sort of soon. <laughs> All right. Um, but for me, <laughs> you know, it, it again draws together that whole you know, the love of tangibility, mm -hmm. love of storytelling, yes. love of ceremony, and it just pushes the limits of that and, mm -hmm. and is this wonderful synthesis. It certainly does push <laughs> the limits. So, all right. Well, I know we're all very in excited and enthusiastic to see this clip.
Well, you certainly have pushed the envelope, B. <laughs> I have never seen anything quite like this in my life, but I look forward to the opportunity when perhaps someday something like this will be available to people and we'll be able to really enjoy our music in ways we hadn't even thought of so Absolutely. far. Absolutely. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us about your work and about your future and where you see this going? Well, um, I guess the th something rather exciting that's just come up on the horizon. Um, do you know Bell Labs? Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, they've mm -hmm. invited me to be the first artist um, to do a performance using their new human digital orchestra. Oh, oh my. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And, thank you. It is wonderful. Um, and that's actually happening in 10 days. Mm -hmm. And we have, I think, a day or two of prep mm -hmm. only. So um, the limits of this are uh, hugely um, expansive, but um, I'm also a little terrified. Well, we will be looking forward to that. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> And uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight and for sharing your wonderful creativity and your gifts with us. And I, I would like to end the segment by reminding you that this uh, series is sponsored in part by the Stanford Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And this center needs volunteers. We are trying to understand much more about Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's and other kinds of neurodegenerative diseases. And for that, we need your engagement. If you are interested at all in learning about volunteering, please call the number on your screen. We'll be delighted to answer your questions and tell you all about what it would be like to volunteer for our center. Thank you for considering our request.